further we go, the, the more God is bringing us back to the very core things that are literally life and death, black and white, true or lies. That is, that is the core of what it is. And so this week, going into this uh, time of fasting, and I'm just like, Lord, you know, what's on your heart? I try and leave it really open in a fasting season. And the only thing that I kept hearing over and over and over the first several days was, will I find faith? Will I find faith? Will I find faith? And it was like this, like, uh, you know, not a, not a scary thing, not a worried thing, but like a, a legitimate question. And so being a church kid, I, I know exactly where that comes from. I know that it comes from uh, Luke 18, and it is literally an authentic question that Jesus asked. It's a phrase that is in the words of red, where Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? And he's stating it. It's not a, it's not a hypothetical. It's not like, a, you know, just by chance, what if? Jesus is stating it like it's an actual possibility. What I find interesting is in Revelation 19, it says that the bride has made herself ready. So there's a partnership that happens. There's that word again. A partnership that happens between God saying, I'm looking for faith, and a bride that says, I am willing to do what it takes to make myself ready. I am willing to actually engage. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody had the thought when you were, you know, getting married, planning the wedding and whatever, like, I hope he shows up. I hope she shows up. I hope, I hope, you know, they're, they're serious about this. You know, you come into it and you, you want to know that there is a full engagement, that the person that you're going to find at the end of the aisle wants to be there. And that is really the tone of what Jesus is saying. He's like, am I going to find faith on the earth? Am I going to find a bride that wants me? Well, that's on us. That's on us to decide to do this. And so if you just open your Bibles to Luke 18... And you're going to find as we go um, through the upcoming weeks and months, like God is just piecing things together for us, the places that he's calling us to. It's so interesting when there's different prayer meetings or different, uh, you know, different groups within the church are like, well, I feel like the Lord is directing us this way or that way. And the puzzle pieces are starting to come together. And legitimately, God is calling us just into more. He's calling us deeper. He's calling us to be set apart and be holy. And um, it's a precious thing. But this particular passage, Luke 18, 1 to 8, we're going to read. And it says, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in the city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, which is essentially, wow, this lady is driving me crazy. I'm going to do something because it's not going to end. And then the Lord said, hear what the unjust, unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And this is a huge statement. It's a huge um, question mark that we have. Pastor George just mentioned prayer. And this is one of the things that increasingly uh, we will be pressing into as a house. It feels very necessary to get aggressive about prayer. And, uh, you know, God is very conversational. A whispered prayer absolutely counts. But there are times and there's different kinds of prayer. You know when you're parenting that there are times when you're just like happy to hang out and cuddle on the couch and laugh and giggle and there's times where it's like you know what I said do that there are different tones in how we communicate right 
And with God, there are different tones, there are different ways that we engage. And so we want to engage in this moment in time in the way that he's asking for it. And I believe that there is a persistence to it. There is a, there is a commitment to stay the course, to hold the line, to continue to knock and keep knocking, to seek and keep seeking, to ask and keep asking. And so the Message Bible puts it this way. It says, the master said, do you hear what that judge, as corrupt as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? I assure you he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? The reality is, this kind of pursuit, this kind of craving, it's, it's the thing that we see in the fact that this woman kept knocking on the door. She kept knocking on the door. What kept her doing that? She was absolutely certain that he could help her. She was absolutely certain that he must help her, that he was her only hope. I think sometimes when we, when we look at North American culture, we have so many rescue packages, so many backup plans, so many things that we could do if this doesn't work out, if God doesn't show up, then I'm going to do this. I believe God's calling us to this kind of thing where we're so living in the lap of faith that we're on the edge of, we're stepping out way past what is normal for us or uh, the ability that we naturally have. When we're pressing in to the promises of God and believing for something extraordinary, and we know, I mean, anybody who has stepped out in faith before, the moment, usually you can have faith, you're believing, you step out, you make a decision, and the moment you cross the line, you're like, oh my gosh, what have I just done? And, and in that moment, you are fully dependent. Either God shows up or I'm hooped. And that's kind of the place where God wants us to be. That's the sweet spot. That's where that partnership happens when we're like, we're the vessel and he's the one that's flowing. He's the one that's doing it. If anybody asks who did this thing, it is all him all the time. To him be the glory. We do not allow flesh to glory in his presence. So it takes kind of that persistence, that actual uh, craving, that question that we, we've talked about um, that is in Tyler Stanton's book, if you got everything you prayed for this week, what would you have? It's a good question. Legit. Do we actually believe that God is who he says he is and he wants to do things, that we are partnering with him? Psalm 121, 1 and 2 in the NIV says, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Where does my help come from? Who's my supply? Who's my source? Where's my direction? Where am I going? Where, what's the plan for my life? It has to come from the Lord or else there is a, there is a struggle on the inside constantly. Some of us, um, I believe today even, God is asking you to cross over a line of absolute yes. Absolute God, it's you. Or nothing. And what do I mean by that? I mean there is, there is a thing. How many of you have waffled on a decision and you're back and forth? You've written the pros and cons for both sides. You compare the list. You think about it. You talk to your friends about it. You come back, write the list again. Your mother reminds you of something you didn't remember to put on the con list. So you put that there. You go back and you talk to your best friend. They remind you of something you should put on the pro list. And then you put that there and you think about it. You think about it. You think about it. You wake up in the middle of your night and it's three o'clock in the morning. Your brain's like, thank you for giving me your attention. Let me work this through with you until morning. You don't need sleep anyway. And, and you wrestle this out and it's exhausting. And the moment you make a decision, it's like the weight lifts off, right? You, we've all experienced this. You're like, you know what? It's done now. It is what it is. Okay. This is what God's calling us into where it's literally, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. The end. He also might choose to use certain other avenues, but ultimately it is always from him. He is the source. He's the place where I, I get everything. He is the core reason that I live. And just um, true disclosure, for some people, you know, we, we all have... Um, ways that our brains work. And I know we've had this like a long season where we're talking more and more about mental health, which is good because these things are, need to be exposed. But on the other hand, I think sometimes the, uh, what does my mind think becomes a God. 
And really, we're supposed to take our th thoughts captive and bring them into obedience to the knowledge of Christ. And sometimes I believe the confusion and the upset that we have in our heads is because we're waffling between what I think and what God says. What people around me say and what God says. What the norm around me is and what God says. And we have to decide once and for all at some point what God says is the truth. And I'm deciding to believe it. And I remember having uh, seasons of time, you know, um, years ago now. But I remember particularly one day driving home. Um, we used to live in Sexsmith and it, before the road got insane with traffic and whatever, and it actually used to be a quiet time driving home. Now it's a recipe for road rage. But um, used to be a quiet drive home, and I remember driving and this thought, because thought bombs can come at you. What if this is all bogus? What if God doesn't actually exist? Like, what if, what if God doesn't actually exist? And it just came, and I, I actually... You know, I didn't think it as though it was my thought, but I, I thought, what would that mean for me? And I, I, I just driving home, and I remember mulling it over. Well, if I live like God exists, that means I live a life that loves and honors him and loves my neighbor as myself. I live a life of morality. I live a life of purpose. And, and when I say live a life of morality, do you know immorality 100% of the time hurts others. It just does. So if I live a life of morality, I live a life of purpose, I live a life seeking what is right and what is light and what is joyful and what is peaceful and what is good and what is kind, I live in that place. I'm pretty sure if I come to the end of my life and I'm, you know, on my deathbed, I am never going to regret living for God, even if he didn't exist. But if I lived like he didn't, and he does, I will regret it for eternity. So, shut up, devil, out of my head. I choose God, you know? And I don't know how many of others of us have had this wrestling match, but if God is true, then it demands a response from us that is a lifelong response. It's a complete and holy response. And um, I came across this... Um, sermon online from uh, Charles Spurgeon in May 5th, 1887. So I'm researching material for what I feel God is saying today. And I come across this message from 1887. And I, like I debated getting up here and just reading it to y'all. He preached what God is saying now, like almost 140 years ago. Like it's amazing how God just keeps, there's nothing new under the sun. From the beginning of time, literally the garden, people have been coming up with ways around what God says. Did God really say, gosh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe there's, a, there's, there's boundary lines. There's possible. There's some, there's some room for flexibility in that. Not the case. And so I, just to give you a point of reference, there's one, one chunk. If you feel like ever looking it up online, it's called The Search for Faith, Charles Spurgeon's May 5th, 1887 sermon. They apparently used to write them out and publish them, like put them in newspapers and everything. But it says, glasses, it says one little chunk of it about this verse, when Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? He says, surely the Savior was not nervous asking the question. None will dare to accuse him of foolish anxiety, but yet he puts it, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? As far as my observation goes, it is a question which might suggest itself to the most hopeful persons at this time. For many processes are in vigorous action which tend to destroy faith. So he's noting something in their generation. He's 54 years old at the time. He's noting something in their generation. Processes are in vigorous action which tend to destroy faith. The scriptures are being criticized with a familiarity that shocks all reverence. And their very foundation is being assailed by persons who call themselves Christians. A chilling criticism has taken place out of a warm, childlike, loving confidence. One, uh, as one has truly said, we have now a temple without a sanctuary. 
Mystery is discarded that reason may reign. Bam. 1887, and he notes this as a change. So we've had 140 years to perk on this. Mystery has been discarded that reason may reign. Men have eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil till they think themselves God. Revealed truth is now not a doctrine to be believed, but a proposition to be discussed. The loving woman at Jesus' feet is cast out to make room for the traitor kissing Christ's cheek. Like Belshazzar, our men of modern thought are drinking out of the vessels of Jehovah's sanctuary in order to honor their own deities. The idea of childlike faith and he, um, the idea of childlike faith is scouted, and he is regarded as the most honest man that can doubt, uh, doubt sorry, man that can doubt the most and pour most contempt upon the authority of the divine word. If this continues, we may well say, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. In some places, the greatest fountain of infidelity is in the Christian pulpit. If this is the case, and I'm sure it is so, what must become of the churches? And what must become of the outlying world? Will Jesus indeed find faith on the earth when he comes? My brethren, why are you so full of worldly care? Why are you so anxious if you have faith in God? Why do you display in worldly things almost as much distrust as worldly men? Whence is this fear, this murmuring, this worry? Oh, my Savior, if you were to come, we could not defend ourselves to the wretched mistrust, our foolish apprehension, our want of loving reliance upon thee. We do not trust you as you ought to be trusted. And if this is, this is the case among those who are such great debtors to thy loving faithfulness, where will you find faith on the earth? It's huge, huh? Where is that unstaggering faith which betakes itself to prevailing prayer and rises above the petty mi miseries of the hour, the fear of a threatening future? I read, I mean, the, the, the sermon goes on and on and on. Not as long as I go on, but pretty long. <laughs> It was one of these things that I'm like, it's like he stepped, when he talks about giving way to reason, is that not my truth? Yeah. Which is the anthem of our day. It's my truth. It's my right. I can think what I want. I can believe what I want. I'm reasoning it out. I can approach God how I want. I can deal with him how I want. It's my truth. I would say in 140 years, there's been a whole lot of people who have died and not landed where they thought they were gonna land because of my truth. He says in his message, when Jesus comes, he will look for precious faith. He has more regard for faith than all else that earth can yield him. He will not look for the abilities we have manifested nor the influence we have acquired. The number one goal of the day is to be an influencer. There is nothing new under the sun, but it has drifted into the far extremes of my life, my choices, my freedom, my wants. This heavenly merchantman counts faith to be the pearl of great price. Faith is precious to Jesus as well as to us. The last day will be occupied with great scrutiny and that scrutiny will be made upon this essential point. Where is their faith and where is there no faith? He that believes is saved. He that believes not is condemned. A search warrant will be issued for the houses and hearts, and the inquiry will be, will be, where is your faith? Do you honor Christ by trusting his word and his blood, or do you not? Do you glorify God by believing his revelation and depending upon his promise, or do you not? The fact that our Lord at his coming will seek for faith should cause us to think very highly of faith. These words penned 140 years ago are out of this, which Jesus spoke himself, which we read in the, the epistles, we read in the life of the early church. We see it as normal in here. When we hear it, I, I mean, I can just picture the, the, the um, outrage probably, or the uproar that there would likely be if somebody stood in a, in a giant room and declared with some fire this kind of thing. 
these days, but it doesn't make it any less true. What Spurgeon spoke then is what Jesus spoke then. It's the truth that will be for all time. And so for us, we've been, we've been babied into this mindset of, you know, well, your faith walk, your journey, your truth, your interests, your reasoning. And God is saying, I want to know when I come, will I find faith in the earth? To personalize it then, will I find faith in your house? Will I find faith in your marriage? Will I find faith in your heart? When I come, will I legitimately find faith? Acts 16, 30 and 31 says, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is when the apostle Paul was in the prison and God shook them loose, shook them free. And the jailer asked his sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. It is simple as that, but for us, we'll say, yeah, I totally believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in a lot of things. I believe that he exists. But the word believe, if we break it down a little further, and I think we've got it for the screen, just for those who are taking notes, the word believe here is to have faith in and upon, to entrust, and to commit. So not just I believe that he is, but I have complete faith in and upon him. I am entrusting myself to him, and I am committing to him. What must I do to be saved? Not just believe that he exists. But actually, more than that, the belief is, see, again, our English language leaves us a little short. I believe that he exists, but I actually have to have faith in and upon. I have to entrust myself to, I have to commit myself to him. It's an all-in kind of thing. And I know that that can be an uncomfortable kind of message, but honestly, we have to, we have to decide whose we are. We have to decide who we belong to. We have to decide what every day that we've been given is for, who it's for, who's, who's motivating us, who's moving through us. It is literally to commit myself into his care. Luke 18, 1, when we talked about this passage, the very beginning, and Jesus is talking about um, before he goes into the woman who's, you know, going after the judge, it actually says... He spoke this parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. The Message Bible says he, he spoke this parable to them that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. This kind of faith, this kind of prayer, this kind of pursuit, it comes from being all in. It comes from knowing it's either God or it's nothing. Either, like, I got to come to God about every part of my life. I got to come to him and ask his wisdom and his direction. I got to come and ask for the, that place of, of uh, counsel for every decision that I make. He is my provider. He is my source. He is my healer. He's my everything. And that persistent prayer is an indicator of knowing that he's the source. I have this um, picture. I meant to send it um, to the computer, but I forgot. Uh, we had our, our G babies over for a week, a couple weeks ago. And there was this one moment that, um, Annie is, she's just, she's being stubborn. She could walk, but she's just choosing not to right now. Um, but she, she wants everybody to pick her up all the time. And I'm standing there in the kitchen and she comes up and she, she pulls herself up on my knees and she's just like reaching up to me. And I took a picture from the top because that picture of she was just like fully expectant. Like, either you pick me up or I got nothing here. Like, she's just fully expectant. And I feel like that's the thing that God's inviting us into is that knowing that we put everything, we're fully expectant on him. And we ask, literally, give us this day our daily bread. Literally, every day, everything, it's part of him. It's walking with him. And so there is a relational component. There's a constant communication and there is a constant expectation. So we want to look just for a moment at what does real faith look like then? Because if it's a real agreement, if it's a real relationship, if it's a real thing that we've come into, then it actually should be so super evident on our lives 
that nobody around us is in doubt about it. They might not know why we are different, but they know there's something different. That is literally biblical. We are, we are meant to be set apart. We are meant to be holy as he is holy. Holy just means set apart. Set apart where there is a mark on us. And so we're going to look at a passage um, in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, the famous faith passage. I'm not going to get into the part where they get caught, sought into or anything like that, but um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Lighten up, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Hebrews 11, we're going to start at verse 1. And we want to look at four factors that are about faith. Four faith factors. And these core things are what we see modeled in faith in action. Um, Old Testament stuff is so fascinating because this was a people who didn't get to feel God on the inside. They had to really walk by faith. You know, they had to, they had to really just go by the, the Lord said this and therefore I'm doing it. And there was no, like we get the counsel of the Holy Spirit. We get that inner presence, that inner guide, that inner witness about things. We are blessed. But when we read this, we see the DNA of faith and we see what it looks like in action. And literally, I know that there's people in this room, people online, we're all going through different things. And you're like, honestly, I'm just trying to make rent this week. I'm just, I just need to know how to survive. I need to know how to not kill my kids. You know, I need to know, I need to know how to not lose it. I need to know how to, how to just pull myself out of the despair. This is the way. It is trusting Jesus as everything. For everything. It is the fullness of the relationship. And I know that seems simplistic, but literally, he is the provider he is the wisdom. He is the peace. He is the hope. He is the freedom. He is everything. And so when we look at this passage, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being still dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God." And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who, what? <laughs> Diligently seek him. Not those who are just like, yeah, I believe in God. It's built into the scripture, the instruction that God's given us, right? By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance, uh, go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, immeasurable as the sand which is by the seashore. Verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Literally, when God says, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus asked, when I come back, am I going to find faith on the earth? Am I going to see an outward showing of the inward truth? Am I going to be living out of the impossible realm and seeing it manifested in the natural realm? Am I going to be putting a draw on that which I can't see? but I know that he is real. Am I actually going to be acting and living like I believe in God? 
literally acting and living like I believe who he is. I, I just feel like legitimately, if we want to be believers, if we want to walk in faith, it only makes sense to believe the whole of the Bible or else none of the Bible. Because if we only believe pieces of it, we walk in confusion. We, we add a little bit of striving. We add a little bit of personal stuff, personal need, personal fixing, personal, you know, mulling to the truth. We have to believe that God is who he says he is and that what he says is right is right and what he says is wrong is wrong and that the direction that he's leading us according to the word is worth following and it's real. It's, it's, it's got to be all in or else it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen. Number one, then, faith is God-centered. It is focused on who he is. We read here that Abel gave a gift that honored God. We know that Cain gave a gift that was pleasing to himself. Cain gave a gift that made sense to him. Cain gave a gift that was reasonable to himself. Abel gave a gift that honored God. It was an act of obedience. It was a, it was a pure offering. We, we see here that um, Enoch pleased God. He lived his life to please God. This was the focus. This was the direction. This is how he went about life. Sometimes we get this, this thing where we're walking around even as believers and we're like, well, I don't know if I feel like I like that or I want that. What does he want? Because if I give a Cain offering, when he wants an Abel offering, it will be discarded. He is God. He can say his preference, and my preference is kind of irrelevant. His preference matters. It is a God-centered thing. Again, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is or that he exists, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, pursue him, come after him, minister to him, love him, bless him. It's coming to him. He is the center. If I'm coming into faith, I'm coming into a place where God is the number one, and I am not. That goes against our culture. Always look after number one. That would be him, not me. Number two, faith obeys. Then so to go along with that, Noah built something that had never been built to rescue people from something they had never experienced on the instructions of a God nobody around him served. Can you imagine? What you doing, Noah? Building an ark. What is that? It's a boat. For what? To rescue animals from the flood. Which is, God's going to rain on the earth and flood. What's rain? <laughs> Water from heaven. Is that right? From who? From God. Which God? The God. Where is he? Somewhere out there. Yeah, I mean, come on. Can you imagine Noah trying to explain to people his obedience? Some of us, I believe in the season that we're in and what is before us may be called into the unexplainable. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It's not a worthy pursuit and it's not right in God's eye. Obedience obeys. Also, we see that Abraham, uh, this, this passage here, verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. And by faith he dwelt in a land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents. I want you to move. Pack up everything and move. Where? Place I'm going to show you. What's it like there? You'll see. How are we going to survive? I'll take care of you. We don't know anybody there. That's okay. You know me. And why are we doing this again? That's where your promise is. Is there going to be a big house there for me? No, you're going to live in a tent. It's going to be pretty, you know, not ideal. Not, you know, it's not as homey as what you're used to, but you got me. 
You're investing in the next generation and the generations to come. I'm asking you for an act of obedience that's going to change the future of humanity. How many of us are being called to do something that's going to change the future of our generations and their generations and their generations? What if I, what if I don't see it before I die? Good company with Abraham. I mean, you two can sit over coffee in the afterlife and talk about how, you know, it was still worth it. Because God is faithful. So he steps out to the place that he's never been. Uh, this, this, I believe, is confirmation to some people. You actually, God has asked you to step out in some areas and you're like, I don't have, I don't know how that's going to work. That's not really an answer. Yes is the answer. Abraham went someplace that he had never seen, a place that he did not know. Number three, faith is a choice. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She decided, this, basically this means is Sarah, Sarah's looking at herself, she's like, I don't see how that would possibly ever happen. I understand what God is saying. I hear it. I'm looking at my circumstances and I'm like, I think he got the wrong address. Like I think there, there are better choices, better options here. She, I mean, she has to work this through. In fact, when she first heard it, she laughed. She laughed as in, as if. And yet, in the process of what faith really is, she decides that he who promised is faithful. So I don't really know how the promise is going to work. I don't actually know the mechanics of it, but I have faith that he is who he says he is. And I am going to decide to believe him. It is literally that, that, that simple and that hard. She receives strength to conceive when she was past the age, because she decided. She didn't even have the strength to conceive the promise that she'd been given. She actually lacked the ability to walk it out. She received the strength to walk it out when she decided that he who promised was faithful. What does our walk like God, with God look like? What does a real life of faith look like? It is deciding, just deciding. Not reasoning, not mulling, not, you know, not that God can't handle a debate. He can. There's apologetists all over the world who work out, you know, things of faith. And, and sometimes we need to get our mind in order. But the core of what we believe and who we believe, we decide. And some of us today, I just believe we need to decide. This is, this is my life. I've committed it completely to God. The word tells me that I, 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 to live is Christ, to die is gain. That it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Meaning legitimately, if I meant that prayer, I am all in. Yes. The number one complaint that you hear from people who are not, interested in the church community is hypocrites. Fair analysis. Because if we really believe what we say we believe, it changes everything. It literally changes everything. It changes how we spend our money. It changes how we spend our time. It changes what we read, what we think, what we do. It changes how we treat others. It changes how we function in our neighborhoods. It changes how we function in our workplaces. It changes what is possible. It changes us from hanging on for the, like, I'm going to, like, go to school, work this long in a career, probably by statistics, I'm going to have three career changes. I'm going to try and lock into something, have a bit of a retirement plan. And dear God, if I can make it to 65 so I can have freedom and actually just do nothing, that would be awesome. When it comes to God, you read things like Caleb going, give me my mountain. You know, it's stuff like Sarah, well past the age going, you want me to be pregnant? Okay, I have no idea how that's going to happen, but I mean, frankly, I'm, 
I'm hitting the middle zone, and I would really like to personally not feel like you tip over the top of the hill and just slide to the grave. You know? Because that sucks. I want to think that according to scripture, it's into, I mean, Paul spent all his time being raised up as a Pharisee, trained and discipled and whatever. He gets knocked off his horse at a decent age. You know, he's well over 30. And it's like, dude, I'm, I have a fresh revelation. I'm totally going in the wrong direction. Change directions and lives this life that is what, like, it's full of God. Isn't that what you crave on the inside? Right? I mean, right now, I think there's, there's sometimes we're tired and we're just like, oh, honestly, I just want a break. Yeah, but there is something to be said for a life of passion. And, and there are breaks in there. Of course, Jesus took time off and went and had quiet time with the Lord and all that. But a life of passion gets you up in the morning every time you wake up. A like, life of passion and purpose says, if I got breath today, there's something that it's for. And, and we go through this and we know that God is first. Faith is God-centered. Faith obeys. Faith is a choice. And number four, just a quick add-on, faith is a relationship. And so all of these things, what we see here, we see uh, Abel, and he's interacting with God. We see Enoch, who walks with God and just disappears, which would be awesome, right? Wouldn't that be like, wow, where is she today? I think God just took her. Like, I don't know, that would be so awesome. But he has this moment, we see, we see Noah who's like walking with God, God tells him to do stuff and he's like, this is wild, are we sure this is gonna work? Well, we now admire like the inventors, we, we admire Edison, we, we admire, pe admire people who like came up with new ideas. Do you know most of them were believers? Like, I believe they had these revelations from God to release new things. We, we see Abraham walk with God. God gives him an instruction. He follows it. He does it. We see Sarah have this encounter, and she walks with God and follows it. But it's a relationship. It is literally coming back to the whatever he tells you to do, do it. What's he asking you for? We, maybe it's something big. Maybe it's literally, can you give me 15 minutes every morning? and just spend some time seeking me. I got some stuff I wanna tell you. It could be anywhere in between. It could be this, this thing, but it is going to be relational. Again, Charles Spurgeon said, our Lord is also the sustainer of faith, for faith is never independent of him upon whom it relies. The greatest believer would not believe for another moment unless grace were constantly given him to keep the flame of faith burning. It is a relationship, it is not a to-do list. And so when we look at that, when we look at Jesus is actually, he's looking for faith, but he's like, are you, are you utilizing what I've given you? How do we know that this is true? Final verse, Hebrews 12, one to two. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This relational thing, this, this thing that we get invited into is so incredible, but this is the necessary step. He's the source. So, if we're not in relationship, it's impossible to stand in faith. Does that make sense? I'm standing on your promises. I, I, got, I got a promise of God on this and I'm just standing on it. I'm just declaring it. I wrote it on sticky notes all over my house. I'm just trusting God. I believe God for it. I'm standing, standing on the word. Do you talk to him? Do you spend time with him? Are you pursuing him? Or are you just pursuing the promise? The relationship is the core of the whole thing. I'm going to have the worship team come up and we're going to finish with this. <laughs> it's kind of a lot. But this place that God is calling us into, I believe, you know, we, we literally can have as much of him as we want. Yes. How much do we want? When Pastor George and Godfrey just shared this, this scripture from Ezekiel 47. And it talks about the water that is ankle deep and knee deep and waist deep and then the swimming. 
We got to... We gotta look ahead in that passage and we see that the product of that kind of flow from the throne of God is fruitfulness of all kinds. There is is salvation, there is healing, there is life that comes out of it. That is the nature of Jesus. That's who he is. But we have to decide to step past the basics of the ankle, the knee, the waist, Ankle deep means I can kind of control it. I can, I can walk ankle deep without there being too much disruption in my life. Knee deep, I'm going to feel that. Waist deep, stuff changes. Right? Where are we at? Some of us are like, toe? I don't know. That's a little weird. Okay. <laughs> at least step up ankle deep. At least decide that. Corporately, there's going to be levels that we go through. Personally, we get to decide. I don't know how many of you have experienced when you are fasting and you set aside what this word tells us to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. The basics of life can become weighty. Generally, when we're in a time of fasting, we minimize media. We minimize the thinking about what am I going to prepare for supper, blah, 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 because you're You know, it's simplified and you spend the extra time pursuing God. Have you noticed how clear you feel in those moments? Just clear. That's the way it's actually intended to be. Those moments of fasting give you a hint of what kinds of weights and things come at us all the time. There's like these little, you know, when you go for a walk in the, in the tall grasses and you come out and these, got those burrs stuck all over your leg, you didn't even feel them come on. Sometimes the world is like that. It's the weights, it's the stuff that just sticks on us without us even realizing it's happening. And so today I just wanna pray a blessing over us that God would clear that. And so God, today as we come into this place of understanding we receive the prophetic word that's been given today we receive what it is you're calling us to to in our relationship with you God there's been this uh, pull towards the deeper purer things Lord even as we've talked about the partnership and we've talked about the uh, fear of the Lord and honoring you for who you are God today we stir up faith and we decide to believe we decide that you are who you say you are and Lord We recognize that the world we're walking through has stuff that sticks to us. There are are things that we can come against that we don't even realize leave a residue on us. And right now, I just pray a fresh release, a washing of the Spirit over this house right now in Jesus' name. And to even those who are watching online, God, I pray a washing of the Spirit over each person, Lord, that the residue, the stuff that we have picked up, the stuff that has become a weight that we didn't even know we're carrying, the things that have made us prickly when we didn't even know that we're being prickly the stuff that has caused our hearts to be hardened and our minds to be confused right now we're just asking for a washing of that God as we choose you, as we seek you as we declare you, as we honor you, I thank you for a shifting from the inside out God that the residue washes off that there is a cleaning Lord and a new beginning of life and life abundantly, I pray that it would be tangible even today God that the weight that is being washed off right now, we would feel it on the inside, that we would feel a lightness, God, a lightness in our step, a lightness in our thoughts, a lightness in our heart, Lord. And God, I thank you for your conviction even that anything that is sinful, that is is causing us to be snared, anything that is holding us back, we thank you for flagging it for us and gracing us to release it, gracing us to cut it off and let it go. I thank you, Lord, you wouldn't ask us to do something that you don't lead us into and empower us to do and so we embrace you today God and we decide to be a people of faith not just people that talk about faith but people that live faith people that manifest faith people that walk by faith God people who are walking in the light God people who walk in love people who transform atmospheres by carrying the presence of the living God with us wherever we go we thank you for the shift Lord in this new season and we declare declare that we choose you. We choose you. We choose you. We choose you, God.